our last McMaster speaker for the afternoon, Dr. Allison Shea. Dr. Shea completed a BSc at the University of Maryland in 2000, her medical degree at the University of Ottawa in 2011, her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Toronto, and she also earned an MSc in neuroscience at McMaster in 2003 and a PhD in medical sciences in 2007 from the University of Toronto. Dr. Shea completed a one-year fellowship at Mount Sinai Hospital in menopause and reproductive mental health in 2017 and is a certified menopause practitioner through the North American Menopause Society. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shea. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and I'm really impressed with the order of the talks because I think things have flowed really nicely um, and I think it will make my job very easy to talk to some of the points so far. So today I'm going to talk about most of the work that we've done and uh, build on what we've heard already. We're going to talk about trends in cannabis use and prevalence of use and what people's perceptions are. So we've heard a bit about that and we did do some work on that. Also, what are dispensaries telling people who want to use cannabis? Um, what is the potential effect on breast milk and what are the future directions for long-term studies? So I'm going to just skip over this because we've heard a lot about this and just get to the meat. Um, so this is really just a schematic of what the work I've done so far since I've been here at McMaster. I came here, I started October 2018. Um, the first phase of our research is we wanted to look at uh, the prevalence of use in the greater Hamilton area um, and to understand patients' perceptions. So we did a large study with almost 500 people in the area, an anonymous survey. This asked them about what they were using, how much they were using, where they were getting information and what influenced that. Um, <clears throat> and we wanted to assess what information people were getting, so um, we called dispensaries uh, a mystery caller approach, um, pretending that we were either pregnant or postpartum and asked them what they recommended to see what information um, pregnant or postpartum people would be getting. Um, then with uh, Sandy, we did some pilot studies um, looking at breast milk and some umbilical cord detection. That was um, thankful from a seed grant from the Decrute Center, so thank you very much for that. Um, and we also did a systematic review looking at the impact of maternal cannabis use during pregnancy on neurodevelopmental outcomes, which is very muddy, um, to say the least. Phase three is what we're doing now um, with Sandy. Because of the seed grant, we've been able to get, uh, I got a new investigator, Sick Kids grant, um, to grow this study into um, 200 people that we're recruiting currently right now to look at the effects of cannabis on breast milk, um, to look at the effects of nutrition. So we're doing a food frequency questionnaire. We're looking at antibodies in the milk. We're looking at um, whether that diet mediates that and looking at some long-term effects. So looking at the ages and stages questionnaire and some of the immune and growth factors. So uh, talking about prevalence, so in general we have heard that prevalence has been on the rise since uh, legalization in Canada and generally the last uh, data that we look at is that the women in general of reproductive age, so not pregnant women, if this has increased to about 14%. Um, the born data, so this is Dr. Corsi's data, showed that this has increased from 2012 to 2017 up to 1.8%, but this is only what people are telling their physicians, and we're hearing a lot that people aren't really telling their physicians, so it's not really a true prevalence of what's going on. Um, we do see that there's higher rates in the first trimester, um, so there is an opportunity for discussion harm reduction approach with um, your patients. Um, and if we think back about first trimester, and we're talking about placental remodeling, I think about what, what's going on in the timing. And if we think that the most important placental remodeling happens between weeks 12 and 16, you know, getting into the second trimester, there really is um, a time that we can do some harm reduction um, as clinicians. Um, I think I hold a unique um, position today as I think that I'm the only obstetrician here, and um, there may be some midwives here, but uh, one of the only people who are actually talking to people about their use and having kind of those harm reduction. Um, discussions and um, as Dr. Van Stone discussed, you know, always wanting to have a harm reduction approach. You know, uh, you use motivational interviewing, not saying, "Oh, you should cut down." It says, "How does this help you? Is there anything else I can do to help you with that symptom? And what have you tried in the past?" Um, from clinical experience, a lot of people who continue to use are people who actually were prior on antidepressant, anti-anxiety anti medications. They've stopped those on their own without consulting a doctor, but they're continuing to use their cannabis for their depression, their anxiety, and their sleep. And that's what I'm seeing for the most part in clinical practice. Um, in terms of those who continue to use, um, we do see trends of those who are um, sometimes younger, those who have lower um, education, and also a, a partner who used. 
Um, so this is uh, some data from the first study that we did. We wanted to see what the prevalence was in the greater Hamilton population. Um, this was a representative sample. So it's important that we didn't just get people from obstetrical care providers. We also went to family practice and uh, midwives. Um, so it was a, a split um, sample um, as well as from high-risk obstetricians. So of all the different types of prenatal care that, was, that were provided in the city, we went to there and we had our research assistants asking them what was going on there. Um, so this was a representative cohort. And what we found is that um, about 5%, so what we're hearing so far, um, plan to use while breastfeeding. So this was while they were pregnant, but they plan to use while they were while they continued during breastfeeding. Of those that were using in can uh, during pregnancy, about 11% used at some point, um, but many of those stopped after the first trimester, and about 4% um, currently consuming cannabis, and that's going on further into the pregnancy, and what predicted whether they continued. So certainly, we see, we definitely saw a split for whether their partner consumed or not. So on the right, you can see um, the partner consuming, and the green bar is those who had only an elementary or high school education. So the biggest risk factors were those who their parent, their partner continued to smoke, and then not having as much of a, uh, a higher education. So certainly there may be a role for proper knowledge translation tools if we can work together and maybe figure out what those should be. Um, in terms of, you know, under-reporting. So um, this was a great study you may have seen from Colorado. They tested 100 umbilical cords, and they were able to do this with, without getting consent for the umbilical cord, um, and they found that 22% of the umbilical cords were testing positive, despite only 2.5% um, you know, saying to the doctor and 6% in an anonymous survey. So we're certainly not getting the numbers that we, we think. Um, we tried to replicate this study, but um, the REB out flat said, no, you can't do this. You can't test their umbilical cords without them knowing. Um, this is a violation of ethics. We went back and forth uh, many times, and eventually they said, okay, have two groups, one a survey group and one an umbilical um, cord only. You can tell them that you're testing for it and see if there's any difference. And we actually did find that 8% um, of cords were tested positive, so we're working on this publication right now, um, but only 4% of them said it in the anonymous survey. So certainly um, we saw a doubling of um, what's actually happening. So, you know, this really says that, you know, we need more comprehensive screening or how do we, you know, how do we figure out who we need to talk to, but really maybe we need to give everybody the information instead of just providing the information to the people we think that are at risk because many more people are using. Moving on to asking people what they thought about cannabis. Um, this was from the same survey, and we asked them where they got information if they did get information. So about a quarter of the people said that they got information from a healthcare provider, um, a lot of them from their physician. So after legalization, we actually were handing out information um, to all new mothers in, the, in their welcome package about cannabis, and we had it right beside the computer when they came into the clinic. Um, I think it's it's not there at the forefront anymore, but we do still have some information um, that's posted. And then of those who sought information, oh, it says about 90, 98% of almost 500, or 98 women, so a very small, actually went and sought information on their own. And when they did, um, the large majority of them went to the internet. <clears throat> when we asked them, do you think it can get through to the baby? Do you think it can get through breast milk? The large majority of them said that, yes, we think it can get through. Um, but they didn't really know beyond that. But they did They did think that it did get to the baby. Um, but 99% said that legalization didn't influence whether they were, they were going to continue. So then we looked at, of those that continued, did getting information from your doctor make a difference? And basically, no. So um, those who got information from their doctor didn't matter. They were going to continue to use anyway. Um, and then we asked... If you did seek out information and you continued to use, where did you get your information? And so it's, we found a significant difference of those who continued to use got their information from the internet or from family or friends and not from a doctor. So they, they were going out and finding their own sources of information. And, and similar to what uh, Dr. Vanstone says, they're not really trusting the information that they're getting. Um, and it's because a lot of the data is flawed. So we need to do better and hopefully provide better data. So the next thing we did is we, as I said, we did this mystery caller approach. We modeled what they had done down in Colorado. In Colorado, they we modeled their study. We worked with Tori Metz. Um, she was one of the co-authors and just basically replicated what they did. We wanted to know if having a formalized education for dispensary users, dispensary workers, as we do in Canada, you have to have a license to sell cannabis in the dispensary, whether this made a difference on what you recommended. Because if you actually go through the training, I, I paid for it and I did the training, um, there's only one slide that said 
says not recommended in pregnancy and postpartum, but they don't really say why, and there's not really much education, just that you shouldn't recommend it. So in 2019, we contacted all listed um, dispensaries that we could find through the government uh, website that did have um, a license to sell cannabis. And we were able to reach 456 dispensaries. Um, you know, in Colorado, they found 70% of dispensaries had someone that said, yes, you can use um, a cannabis product while pregnant. So luckily, ours is not that abysmal. You know, we only had... Um, 7% um, that did say that, yes, it is use, safe to use cannabis in pregnancy. And um, for the most part, they recommended an edible or cannabis oil. But as we've now heard in the morning, that it's that's not really any safer. But per perhaps maybe it will be a harm reduction approach once we uncover more information. Um, but... Um, it was interesting that there was a very difference among the provinces. So if when you went to Quebec, everyone was like, no, 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 call your doctor immediately, go to a pharmacist, like you definitely can't, versus um, you're more likely to uh, recommend it if you were in Alberta or British Columbia. So the next thing we wanted to do, um, and thank you for the manpower of residents, we were able to make all these phone calls. Um, we did the same thing, but we pretended that we were a pregnant person and said, we, we're, we're feeling very stressed for, or anxious. We're two months postpartum. We're exclusively breastfeeding your baby. Is there something you can recommend um, to help me to calm my nerves? And we did find that the majority recommended don't, that it, you should talk to your healthcare provider, but there was still about 20%, which was striking to us that said, yes, it's safe to use and you can use a cannabis product, despite the fact that you're exclusively breastfeeding. Um, so maybe we need to work harder on um, first finding out the information and then providing the correct knowledge translation tools. Okay. I'm just going to skip through this. We've heard a lot about this. Um, but the next thing we did was our systematic review, which was um, quite muddy and quite difficult to do. Um, we wanted to look at uh, attention and uh, cognitive function and intelligence in uh, school age children, so 6 to 18. Um, there were about 28 studies that we were able to use. The problem is the majority of the studies, the data came from three studies, so the Ottawa Perspective Study, um, the study out of um, Philadelphia, and then there's a newer study called the ABCD study um, that did ha does have some, some good data coming out of it. Um, but when you actually looked at um, the data and you tried to put them into to brackets of, of what people measured and put them into school age groups, so preschool, school age, and then adolescence, um, the data was not really clear at all. Um, for in terms of attention, five Five out of 11 studies showed that there were worse scores, um, but the other said no difference. Um, when we looked at memory, two out of seven said there were worse scores, um, but this was particularly more for heavy use. So what we found is kind of all of the outcomes that we looked at, it was more that if you were using it every single day rather than the occasional use. So I think there is a role for a dose response effect and you know, a harm reduction and supportive effect um, or um, outcome if we want to support our patients if they need to continue to use um, and to cut it down. Uh, the problem is data is heterogeneous, and most of them did not use the same measures, so it's hard to, to pool the studies and to do that nice forest plot. There weren't really a lot that we could compare, um, and there's no understanding of timing of use in a lot of the studies, and only one study of these 28 studies reported use during lactation. So um, we know now that there are high levels that can be found in the breast milk, and so um, we need to continue to think about neurodevelopment. So moving on to breastfeeding. So we've heard a little bit about this. We know that um, cannabis is detectable in breast milk, um, and we do see that there is a peak effect. So one hour after after smoking and um, inhaled use, and this was in a study that um, users had been abstinent for 24 hours, and they gave them a standardized joint, and then they measured the levels um, um, in the breast milk, the one hour and then four hours later. And they were still detectable four hours later. So this is significant because a newborn baby is feeding every two to three hours. So they are getting those repeat exposures um, and not just that single hit. You know, if we're thinking about a harm reduction approach, we could say don't feed that baby, you know, within the first hour after use. When we talk about having a glass of wine, many women um, who want to have their glass of wine, um, they'll have their glass of wine as they're breastfeeding their baby or right after because they know that it's going to be, you know, two, two and a half hours for that glass of wine to get out of their system and they'll be safe. So it's not the same um, pharmacokinetics or pharmodynamics, but you can, again, do a harm reduction approach if we're going to help to support these women. Um, what's important to know is that there was another study that looked at milk bank, and they had 50 users, and, and THC was detectable up to six days after use. 
Um, so this, um, Sandy talked briefly about this study, and this was the pilot study that we looked at. Um, was there any difference in um, cannabis users' breast milk? And um, we measured the milk once at six to eight weeks postpartum, and we looked at cannabinoids, macronutrients, lactose, and IgA levels. Um, and we did find that we could detect the THC um, in the breast milk, so that was exciting. And now um, we have a lab at McMaster who um, has now validated that technique, and we're going to continue to work with them. Um, and what the most exciting things is that we found that there was a difference in the lactose levels. Um, so we don't really know what this means, is that the lactose levels were higher in the users versus the non-users. Um, so we need to see if we can replicate this in a larger data. But what I think is the most striking data is that those who were users had lower levels of IgA. Everybody talks about wanting to you know, breastfeed for one nutrition, but also for the immune benefits. So if you're decreasing the main immunoglobulin that helps to fight that baby's, Im that baby's immune system, again, um, you know, all the pathogens when baby's born, it has no immune system at all except for passive immunity for what they received from the baby during pregnancy from the mom and then through that breast milk. And so if they're not getting that same protection, this may have significant implications. Um, so that leads us to our next study um, and that we're going to see if whether or not this changes the trajectory of both growth um, uh, other macronutrients, um, other immunoglobulins, and whether this affects whether a baby got sick, how much baby was admitted to hospital, how many fevers a baby had. We're going to look at number of rashes baby had, um, and to also look at some basic developmental um, outcomes during using the ages and stages questionnaire. We're lucky because we have Dr. Sara Green, who's been an informant with us on this study, so we're actually op asking a lot of open-ended questions and from a supportive point of view, so we're not, uh, you know, offending these moms and making them feel stigmatized, um, and they are are getting compensated well for their time as well. Um, so hopefully they do see value in this. And we really tell them we don't know what it does to breast milk. So hopefully you can help us find out so that we can create some better knowledge translation tools. So take home messages that we know that it's very common, um, that it is in the breast milk, um, but the data is messy in humans. Um, but hopefully as we can all collaborate, then we can get some more information and collaborate. Thank you. Very nice presentation. I think the last piece of data there with the IGA is extremely interesting. And I wonder as you go forward, um, if you can really delineate the constituents of the, the, the composition of cannabis, if it's CBD or THC rich, because I believe that it's the CBD that could be anti-inflammatory in the breast milk, because CBD has been shown to be anti-inflammatory in the cell-based system. So um, are you, and I know it's so hard to do in these type of studies to really get at what is the composition of CBD and the ratios of THC, but are you going to try to get that information out? Yeah, so we're going to measure um, the THC metabolites, the CBN, CBD, uh, and looking if we can detect all of them. Most of them were detectable in the breast milk. THC was certainly the highest concentration, um, but we're going to be measuring all of them. Um, you know, we ask people what they use, but a lot of time they don't know what they use, so they don't know what strain. They kind of said whatever they get, but yeah, um, most people I find are, are not you know, going to the Ontario Cannabis Store or going to a licensed dealer. They're just getting it from uh, friends and family. Um, and the majority of them are continuing to smoke rather than um, using other methods. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> 